back of my shirt says it's made of 100% cotton. If I were to have my own tag, it would go something like this. Oxygen, 65%, carbon, 20%, hydrogen, 10%. Made in Italy. Indeed, if we were to break down our body into the atoms it's made of, we would find out that we are made for the most part of just a handful of elements, oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen, with some nitrogen and sulfur. In the end, these five elements are the stuff we are made of. Water, which is the most abundant molecule in our body, is made of hydrogen and oxygen. From the air we breathe, we only retain oxygen. The three macronutrients, proteins, carbs, and fats, are all made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, with some nitrogen and sulfur in proteins. These five elements alone, however, although predominant and able to build by themselves water, air, lipids, carbs, proteins, and most vitamins, are not sufficient to sustain life. For our body to be able to function, we need a lot of other inorganic elements, although in small to very small amounts. In nutrition, we refer to these inorganic elements as the minerals. Six of these minerals are called major minerals or macro minerals, not because they are bigger or because they are more important, but because they are present in our body in relatively larger amounts, and therefore we need larger amounts of them from food. These six minerals are calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, chloride, and magnesium. Calcium is the most abundant mineral in our body. We have about 1200 grams, mostly in our bones. We have about half as much phosphorus, also largely in our bones, and then about 200 grams of potassium, 100 grams of sodium and chloride, and 30 grams of magnesium. Our daily requirements for all these minerals is greater than 100 milligrams. Sulfur is sometimes classified as a major mineral, but we only need it as part of the amino acids methionine and cysteine, and the B-group vitamins thiamine, biotin, and pantothenic acid. Thus, we do not have a requirement for sulfur per se, and as long as our protein and B vitamin requirements are met, our need for sulfur is also covered. The major minerals are all electrolytes. They regulate fluid balance and electrochemical gradients and buffer blood pH. This allows for proper conduction of nerve impulses and muscle contraction, including heartbeat and breathing. If the electrolytes are in the right proportion, acid-base balance can be more easily maintained. In our diet, however, we often have an excess of chloride and phosphorus and a lack of potassium and calcium, which results in a net acidifying effect. In this situation, as we will see later, to buffer pH, the body will need to steal calcium from our bones. On top of the major minerals, there are eight more minerals that are recognized as essential, but are present in much smaller amounts in our body, and thus we need smaller amounts from food. Back in the days when analytical chemistry didn't have very advanced tools, these minerals were present in such small amounts in our body tissues that we could only determine their presence, but not their exact quantity, which was simply reported as present in trace amounts. And while today we do have advanced techniques to quantify these minerals with much greater precision, we still refer to them as the trace minerals. And these are iron, zinc, selenium, iodine, copper, chromium, manganese, and molybdenum. But wait, there's more. On top of the major and the trace mineral, there are many other minerals that are generally referred to as the ultra-trace minerals. These are minerals whose essentiality could never be proven because if they are needed, they are needed in such small amounts that clinical deficiencies never occur and cannot even be induced in lab animals to study their effects. Some of these minerals may be nutritionally beneficial, and we have some evidence for boron, vanadium, silicon, tin, nickel, bromide, lithium, and germanium. Even some of the minerals that are extremely toxic and potentially deadly, such as lead, arsenic, cadmium, or mercury, may be needed in very small amounts. The study of the ultra-trace minerals goes beyond the scope of our introductory nutrition course 
and for them we have no specific dietary instructions other than a varied diet. For most trace and ultra trace minerals, the amounts present in food are extremely variable depending on the soil where plants grow, the food that animals eat, or the water that they drink. For example, in many areas of China, the soil is extremely poor in selenium, so the whole food chain ends up being low in selenium, and as a result, Kashan's disease, a selenium deficiency disease, is endemic in those areas. Problems like this one are less of a concern today because the food chain today is globalized, and we eat food coming from all over the world. However, it is a growing problem with the recent trend of eating locally grown and raised foods. There are of course many advantages in eating only local food, but there are also drawbacks, and the risk of trace mineral deficiencies is one of them. Another big risk with eating local only is environmental contamination. If the local soil is contaminated with a toxic compound, this will reflect in the whole food chain, and so we keep getting the same contaminant, and it is much easier to accumulate it to dangerous levels. Conversely, if we eat food coming from many different places, these effects tend to cancel out for the principle of variety. Another consequence of this inherent variability is that food composition tables are not very reliable when it comes to trace and ultra-trace minerals. The amounts of zinc in the apple I analyze here and today may be completely different from the amount of zinc in the apple you are eating somewhere else tomorrow. Digestion of minerals is very easy. Minerals do not need to be broken down during digestion, so they don't really need to be digested just extracted from the food matrix and absorbed as such. Absorption of minerals, however, is trickier. Some minerals, such as sodium or potassium, are absorbed freely or at a very high rate. For some other minerals, absorption is much more limited. For example, less than 5% of the chromium present in food is absorbed on average. Mineral absorption, however, is also highly variable depending on how much we need. When the body needs more, intestinal absorption increases. For example, calcium absorption is on average 25%, but can go as high as 60% if our needs are increased. Vice versa, when we're getting too much from food, our absorption decreases to try to prevent toxicity. Do you remember the experiment by Jackson and colleagues on zinc absorption? When they gave less and less zinc to a group of volunteers, their intestine was absorbing more and more zinc in order to compensate. Some dietary form of minerals, however, escape such mechanism of homeostatic control at the absorptive level because they are absorbed as intact compounds via different routes of absorption. This is the case, for example, of heme iron, or many amino acid chelates of minerals, which are absorbed following the same absorption route of the amino acids, not the one of minerals. Although this is less of a problem with food, we have to be very careful with supplements. A big advantage of minerals, especially if compared to the vitamins, is their stability. Minerals are much more stable and generally unaffected by heat or light, as their structure doesn't change. However, they still can be washed away, so significant losses are possible when we overwash fruits and vegetables, and when we boil food and then discard the water. Another major source of mineral losses, as you already know, is refining of whole grains, peeling fruit, and discarding the external layers of vegetables. The food matrix and its composition are important sources of variation in mineral bioavailability. Other substances present in a food can bind or interact with minerals, making it easier or harder to absorb them. For example, calcium in milk is absorbed at a rate of about 30%. Spinach has a comparable amount of calcium, but it is not a very good source because most of it is bound to oxalate, and so absorption is only 5%. Many other green leafy vegetables, however, such as kale or bok choy, are very good sources of bioavailable calcium, which is absorbed at 50-60%, to 60%, more than milk itself. Citric acid 
enhances calcium absorption. So if you squeeze some lemon juice on your veggies, you will absorb even more calcium. Another typical mineral binder is phytate, or hexaphosphoric acid, which is present in whole grains and legumes and chelates, zinc, copper, manganese and iron, thus reducing their absorption. Humans do not have the enzymes, called phytases, to free these minerals from phytate. Although some bacteria do, so some of them in our gut may be able to chop them off. Germination, fermentation and soaking of whole grains and legumes enhances natural phytase activity, making minerals more bioavailable. Vitamin C enhances absorption of copper and non-heme iron, even in the presence of phytate. Look at this old experiment by Holbert and colleagues from 1989. He measured iron absorption in a group of volunteers following a standard meal. Then he added a whole lot of phytate to the same meal and measured iron absorption again. Not surprisingly, iron absorption decreased by 70%. But then, together with phytate, he also gave 100 mg of vitamin C. Lo and behold, this small amount of vitamin C was able to completely abolish the effect of phytate. In other words, iron absorption was the same as the phytate-free meal. So squeezing a little bit of lemon juice in the water you drink with your meals may really be a very good idea to maximize mineral absorption. Minerals also interact between themselves. For example, zinc and copper compete for the same carrier, so if we have a large excess of one mineral, then the other will be displaced and may become deficient. Indeed, people making indiscriminate use of zinc supplements with megadoses of this mineral often end up developing anemia due to copper deficiency. The bottom line is, mineral nutrition is such a delicate balance you have to be extremely careful before adding minerals here and there or taking random supplements of one specific element. Mineral metabolism is a very delicate system of checks and balances. You have to be very, very careful when you use supplements or change the food supply because you cannot predict everything that you're going to affect.